I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, a win for life. North Carolina lawmakers override a veto to pass the latest pro-life ruling. We have the latest budget battle. Congress weighs in on the latest economic debate with President Joe Biden. We're on Capitol Hill, looking towards the future. The Vatican's top charity organization elects a new leader. Plus, it is never too early to evangelize. We speak with a young boy behind a popular new podcast for kids. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, a measure to ban most abortions in the state of North Carolina after 12 weeks is set to become law. This after GOP lawmakers overrode the Democratic governor's veto on the bill. Senate Bill 20 makes medical sense. And Senate Bill 20 is common sense. The House completed the second and final part of the override vote. The outcome represents a major victory for Republican leaders. Prior to this proposal, North Carolina had banned abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. A federal appeals court heard arguments today on access to a widely used abortion drug. The main issue is the FDA's original approval of Mifepristone more than 20 years ago. The case will likely be headed to the Supreme Court. Uh, the White House says the new North Carolina abortion ban will harm patients and threaten doctors. The president and vice president both side with pro-abortion groups, including one that held a big event last night in Washington, D.C. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Vice President Kamala Harris sent out a tweet today calling pro-life leaders, quote, extremists. Now, we knew she planned to speak at last night's event, but... President Joe Biden's appearance there came as a last-minute surprise. President Joe Biden makes an unannounced appearance at a pro-abortion event. Hello, hello, hello. Where he praised the former House Speaker. Nancy Pelosi is going to go down in history as one of the most consequential speakers in the history of the United States. Senate. Vice President Kamala Harris also spoke at the We Are Emily Gala. So Emily's list, again, I will ask you, stand if you are in the fight for the right of all people to express their vote through their voice. White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre pushes the administration's pro-abortion stance, too, calling a new pro-life law in North Carolina a dangerous bill that is out of touch with the majority of North Carolinians and will make it even more difficult for women to get the reproductive health care they need. But pro-life groups like Concerned Women for America call it a win for life, and Students for Life say the measure will protect some pre-born babies from the violence of abortion. Meanwhile, the ongoing debt ceiling debate. I'm confident that we'll get the agreement on the budget that America will not default. Before he left for the G7 and cutting short his upcoming overseas trip in hopes of closing out a deal with Republicans, the president went before the cameras. Every leader in the room understands the consequences that we fail to pay our bills. Also today, President Biden honors heroes from across the country who saved lives and in some cases gave their lives in protecting the public with the Medal of Valor, the nation's highest honor for bravery by a public safety officer. Justin shielded the newborn with his body crawl back through the smoke to the window and down to safety. New York's bravest. Yeah, some very brave public servants right there. Now, back to the debt negotiations. The president also said today that while he's at the G7, he'll be in constant communication with his team regarding those debt negotiations. And he, he said he'll also be speaking with, or at least in contact with, the House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. And the president also said today that he cut his trip short to overseas so he can be in Washington for the final negotiations next week. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Our Congress and the White House are racing against the clock to find a path to avoid default on the nation's debt. The mood on Capitol Hill is hopeful. Congressional leaders say that they want to reach a framework agreement by the end of the week, but a couple of sticking points remain. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest. As the key players in the debt limit negotiations keep talking, the clock is ticking. We're just a handful of days before the June 1st default deadline. Meanwhile, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy remains optimistic. 
he finally agreed to something that every other time we've been able to solve a problem has worked, the structure of negotiations. But now we're along such a short timeline, it makes it almost harder. But if there's one thing you know from me, I never give up. I have the grit, the perseverance, and we're going to get it done. If a deal is reached, Republicans say they will act quickly. So, you know, we will be ready for that if the negotiations uh, yield something. But the negotiations have to actually yield uh, ideas. If the president has something he's willing to put on the table, it's time now. If a deal is not reached in time, Democratic leadership is looking at the possibility of forcing a vote with a discharge petition, but it would require Republican help. The discharge is people are able uh, potentially to sign it uh, tomorrow, uh, but that is not any instruction that we have given our, our colleagues at this point. We want to see how these conversations go. One of the sticking points is work requirements for Medicaid recipients. What the Republicans are engaged in is just a cynical game to see if by tying people up on one more requirement and one more hurdle and one more twist and one more turn that some people will walk away. Senate Minority Whip John Thune says the nation's debt should concern everyone. If spending reform is just a Republican priority, then there's something seriously wrong with the Democrat Party. Because with a national debt like ours, spending reform should be a priority for everyone. Senator Rick Scott tells me the House passed bill is full of common sense. So one, we're going to get people back to work. Number two, we're going to get rid of some of the wasteful spending. Number three, we're going to watch what we spend going forward. Who doesn't believe in that? Congressional leaders hope to have the framework done by Friday so Congress can pass it before the deadline. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, a Major League Baseball team is being accused of anti-Catholic bias. A report in the Washington Examiner says the Los Angeles Dodgers will honor a transgender group that uses Catholic imagery in sexualized context. The group calls itself the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Go now to Christopher Bedford, executive editor of the upcoming journal at Common Sense Society. Chris, great to have you with us. A lot to get to. But first, I want to get your thoughts on this decision by the Dodgers. And what do you think is behind this? Well, it's, it's gross, uh, for one. It's stupid. It's unimaginative. It's boring. I mean, Madonna has been doing things like this for decades, and they still come out and try to say that just attacking us, attacking our faith, attacking saints, attacking nuns, uh, is some kind of, some kind of somehow a bold decision or pushing the envelope. Really, it's just gross, uh, and it's sacrilegious, and it's something that a mainstream baseball team has no business doing. Uh, I'm excited to see that this isn't just a Catholic League issue. This is something that you see Senator Marco Rubio coming out with. And hopefully we'll see more and more of this, uh, where you've seen, uh, for example, South Dakota's Governor Kristi Noem came under a lot of fire for, for breaking on this single issue. Uh, Bud Light has seen sales drop 25 percent of the best-selling beer in the world, uh, because of, at least in the United States, because of this issue. So if the Dodgers want to follow suit, then I, I, I hope to see uh, an impact on that. Businesses should know that attacking religions, even Catholics, is, is not allowed. Uh, also in the news, lawmakers yesterday revisited the FACE Act to add whether the FBI and other law enforcement agencies are targeting pro-lifers. Now, meantime, a pro-life pregnancy center in Florida says the bodies of three mutilated animals were left outside of its building last week. Uh, uh, the executive director of that center even saying it may have been part of some type of ritual. Um, Chris, your thoughts on all of this? It's, it's wild to see. I get, similarly to the Dodgers uh, transgender group here, is these pe people aren't hiding. They're being really open. They're co doing animal sacrifices. They're beheading statues of Mary. They're beheading statues of Christ. They're attacking churches. And it's gotten to a point where the local crisis pregnancy center here in Alexandria uh, previously has had to ask for Knights of Columbus to come forward and just sit with the volunteers there to make sure that they're safe from attacks. At the same time, the FBI has shown an extreme reluctance to uh, investigate a lot of these different cases. Talking to people who have worked at crisis pregnancy centers who've been attacked, targeted by attacks, they tell me, yeah, we have the surveillance footage of the suspects, we have license plates, we have cell phone pings, but no one's being arrested. At the same time, uh, elderly activists and wheelchair-bound pro-life activists are being arrested and charged. That's an uneven use of the law, and it's the kind of uneven use of the law that sparks distrust and is very dangerous for a civil society. Uh, Chris, I want to switch gears now. Uh, the back and forth continues on the debt limit debate. Curious, how do you see this playing out, and who do you think will end up being the winner here? 
Oh, it's, uh, I can tell you the American people certainly aren't going to win. The, de the debt ceiling is going to go up. So the Uniparty, uh, Washington, D.C., is definitely going to win in the end here. It comes down to a couple of minor tweaks. Kevin McCarthy has put forward that he's got a red line, which is that there's, going, there's got to be some kind of work requirements involved with some of the massive uh, benefits that are given to low-income residents and low-income citizens of, of this country. Almost out of time, Chris, but I want to talk about uh, the release of the long-awaited Durham report. What's your main takeaway from this, and what do you think, if anything, will come from it? Nothing will come from it. Uh, the FBI is claiming, uh, I mean, the FBI has been shown, essentially, and with proof, uh, to have been completely full of it in their attacks on the previous administration, uh, on, the, on the Russiagate, everything. This country was really dragged through it, through the corporate media, by our intelligence agencies for four years. The presidency was completely undermined. Trust in law, uh, law enforcement was undermined. It became a really partisan issue. And the, the FBI is now claiming that a lot of those problems were fixed. Director Ray saying everything's fine now, don't worry about it, go back to sleep. But at the end of the day, I don't think anyone's going to actually be held accountable because the folks who would hold them accountable are the ones who are actually guilty of this. Okay, we're going to leave right there. Chris, always great to be with you and get your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including a grain of hope. Russia extends a deal allowing Ukraine to help struggling countries. Plus, we speak with the host of a popular new kids podcast inspired by Ascension's Bible in a Year. An update on a story we brought you earlier. A report now says the Los Angeles Dodgers have rescinded the invitation to the transgender group accused of using sexualized Catholic imagery. The Catholic League says it began an email campaign to the commissioner of Major League Baseball asking him to have the Dodgers pull that invitation. Oh, Russia has agreed to extend a deal allowing Ukraine to ship grain to parts of the world in need of food. The accord will now be in place for another two months. Meantime, the Kremlin says a deal to ease shipments of Russian food and fertilizer is not being followed. It is hoping for a resolution by the end of the week. Oh, Beijing officials say Taiwan is still Chinese territory despite so-called bribes to former politicians. <laughs> Spokesperson of the Taiwan Affairs Office of China's cabinet made the remarks at a press conference today. China says they are ready to take, quote, decisive measures if Taiwan's independence continues to challenge the bottom line of the mainland. While attacks on two Catholic churches took place in Mexico earlier this week, one of the churches was set on fire after its recent reconstruction and suffered significant smoke damage. The tabernacle was stolen from the second church. Both parishes condemned the crimes. A clergy in France will now be required to carry an ID card showing whether they are in good standing to celebrate Mass and hear confessions. The French Bishops' Conference introduced the car to intensify the fight against sexual violence within the church. All the new head of Caritas Internationalis is looking to the future of the Vatican's preeminent charity following a tumultuous period. The 22nd General Assembly of Caritas Internationalis took place in Rome yesterday. A new leadership was elected. Archbishop Isio Kachiku of Tokyo was elected president of Caritas. Alistair Dutton was also named the new secretary general. Joining us now from Rome is Alistair Dutton, secretary general at Caritas Internationalis. Sir, great to be with you today. Can you tell us more about the General Assembly and what issues did you focus on in addition to the elections? Good evening, Tracy, and thank you for having me this evening. Um, we've just finished what has been a wonderful General Assembly that ran from uh, Thursday through to yesterday. And there was a wonderful sense of the family coming together after the pandemic, after four years since we were last came together for our, our General Assembly. And there was a real spirit of goodwill and the family coming together, um, of friendship. And um, we started very fortunately with a, an audience with Pope Francis. And that really set the tone for the first day, which we spent down within the walls of the Vatican City. 
both uh, dining together and there was a sense of those family meals. But also we got our teeth into the business on the first day and got on. And so that day really set the tone for the next six days, a sense of a family coming together both to be, build those relationships to be together, but also to um, to get on with the business, to look ahead to the next four years, to concentrate on what our priorities would be, and yes, to elect some of our uh, our officers. Yeah, and you were elected uh, as new secretary general. Can you share with us your reaction to this election and what you hope to bring to the organisation? I'm enormously honoured and excited to have been elected as Secretary General. Uh, I've been with Caritas now for almost three decades, and it really is my home, my family and my vocation. And in that time, I've worked in over 70 countries with many of the members. Um, lots of that time in humanitarian settings, but also across the whole spectrum of, of their work. And I think the first thing I want to bring is that sense of the family and building the spirit within the family and really helping us all to coalesce now around those priorities that we've just set for ourselves to look at the most effective ways to work together and to help Caritas to go on to genuinely be one of the most effective development networks in the world. And Caritas, as we all know, um, as mentioned, is involved in many humanitarian projects. What are you currently working on within your organization? Well, it's already been quite a year. Uh, for now, the last 16 months, as everyone knows, there's been a huge focus in the Ukraine um, as war, that brutal war continues and, and people are suffering. And we have two of our members who are based within the country who, from the very first days, were providing life-saving aid to the people of their communities. They were from those communities and they have been committed to serving those communities since. So obviously the Ukraine remains an enormous priority. And when I talk about the Ukraine, obviously it's then the countries around the Ukraine. So it's not just those who have remained. But so the Ukraine is a major priority. Um, we had the earthquake in Syria and Turkey back in, in February. And then, of course, we've got that dreadful civil war that has broken out uh, in Sudan. And one of the bishops of Sudan has been with us. Uh, it was wonderful to see Bishop Daniel again. But he had to flee the country uh, and really came here and was, was talking firsthand about the experience and what the country is going through. So those three are very large in the media. Now, Alistair, thank you so much for your time and thank you for your work. We appreciate it. Alistair Dutton, Secretary General at Caritas Internationalis. Thank you again. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, honoring a dedicated saint. We learn about a man who Pope Francis refers to as the greatest missionary of modern times. Plus, five stars. We speak with a third grader who is already leading kids closer to Christ. Pope Francis says a 16th century saint who risked his life to travel and proclaim God's never-ending love remains relevant even today. Well, the Holy Father spent almost his entire weekly talk discussing the light of life of St. Francis Xavier. Pope Francis says centuries ago, just like today, so many people need Jesus, and the saint became, quote, the greatest missionary of modern times. His secrets were constant prayer and the knowledge that no matter where he was, God was at his side. Well, finally tonight, Teddy Howe is a podcaster in Michigan. His series is based on the Bible, and he says that he hopes it brings people to Christianity. One last note about Teddy. Well, Teddy is nine years old. The third grader is the host of the Kids Bible in a Year with Teddy. It has received more than 100 reviews online, almost all of them five stars. The episodes last around 10 minutes and include a self-written prayer. The podcast is based on the widely popular The Bible in a Year 
with Father Mike Schmitz. And that young podcaster, Teddy Howell, joins us now along with his dad, Sean. Thank you both so much for being here today, guys. Uh, Teddy, I want to start off with you. First off, congratulations on the podcast. That is amazing. Uh, tell us a little more about why you wanted to do it. Uh, I was listening to Father Mike, and I just wanted to do my podcast, and my parents finally let me do it. I think that is amazing. Teddy, talk to us about all the work that goes into it. I know it's not easy. I mean, how long does it take you to prepare for it? Uh, it takes me um, an hour at least. Uh, so first we like do what we need to do, like write it down. And then next we get it on a sheet of paper. And then I do it apart one by one. And then my mom and dad edits it. And then my mom and dad released that episode. That is great. That's a lot of hard work. And you also uh, write a prayer for each one. So how do you decide on which prayer to write? Um, I just think of it uh, from the Bible. I get it from the Bible after I read it. Well, that is so wonderful. I want to talk to your dad, Sean, now. Sean, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm curious, what was your family's reaction uh, when Teddy said that he wanted to do a podcast based on the Bible? Um, really, we were just uh, blown away and uh, humbled, really, uh, at God working through our son, um, his love for, the, for God, for the church, um, for the Bible, um, you know, just blows us away. He, you know, he's got... Uh, five brothers and sisters. Um, and so he bunks with a couple of them and every night he's under the covers with his, his headlamp reading, reading the Bible. He just loves to do it. So, um, when he brought up that he wanted to do a podcast, uh, my wife and I, you know, we weren't really sure how to make a podcast. We've never done that. Uh, but we asked some friends what the, what the right apps are, what the right tools are. And we, we got it started and, um, you know, Teddy's the mastermind behind it all. And we're just, we're grateful to be along for the ride. That is so, is so amazing. So what has the feedback uh, been like? What have you been hearing, Sean? Yeah, so the feedback's been very positive. So uh, it was pretty crazy to see things go viral online on, on the Facebook posts. So the feedback we've gotten on a lot of the posts are just, you know, how much they love seeing Teddy's love for God and that he just wants to share the word of God. Um, we've gotten some some feedback of people hearing the right thing, you know, He's, he's making it for kids, but there's grownups too that are listening and, you know, God is speaking through uh, what Teddy chooses to talk about that day. And we've gotten feedback that's exactly what they needed to hear that day. So it's been a blessing to, to get that, that feedback. That, that is wonderful. Teddy, I'm curious if someone, you know, around your age or another kid says they want to do something like this, um, do you have any advice for them if they wanted to do a podcast or another project? Um, I don't really know what I'll give to them, but that's it. Prayer. A prayer, read a Bible story or two. There you go. And you're such an inspiration to so many. So you just doing this uh, is inspiration for them. Sean, I want to ask you, I mean, I, you and your family must be so, so proud of Teddy. I'm curious, you know, do you have a favorite podcast of his that he did or at maybe a fa favorite part of maybe just watching him do it and put it all together? Uh, we're, you know, we're we're very proud. His entire family is very proud of him uh, for just, you know, taking the time to, to read God's word, to share it. Uh, with everyone, you know, his goal is that, you know, more people hear God's word and, you know, become Catholic. Um, you know, my favorite part is just the prayers uh, prior to each episode. You know, he sits down, he reads the story, thinks about what does that mean to him? Um, you know, how does it apply to him today? And he comes up with a prayer and it's it's just great to see, uh, you know, the thought and the um, the love that comes through on on his prayers in each podcast. So, I love each and every prayer of his 14 episodes so far. Oh, that is so great. Really quickly, we're, we're out of time, but if folks want to tune in to the podcast, how can they do so? Where do they find it? Uh, so if you look on Facebook under Kids Bible in a Year with Teddy, or you just do, it, do a Google search on Kids Bible in a Year with Teddy, 
It's available on all the major uh, podcasting platforms, and you can follow him on Facebook uh, for, for updates and news on his podcast. Well, that is wonderful. We're going to do that. Teddy and Sean, thank you so much for your time today. And Teddy, congratulations. God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.